We are now recording. Okay, great. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Can I get one more series of I can hear you's in the chat box to all panelists and attendees just to make sure that you can hear me okay. All right, good, that's enough. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, my name is Laura Garropy. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm the chair of the ACRL ULS Professional Development Committee. I'll be serving as the introducer and closer for this program today, and my colleague Rebecca Graff, who's another committee member, will be assisting and moderating the questions throughout the session. This is one of an ongoing series of online programs sponsored by our committee, um, and we are so, so happy to have you here today for Trans and Gender Nonconforming Inclusion in Libraries presented by Krista McCracken, who I will introduce more fully in a few moments. We're especially excited to have you all here today. Um, this was a sellout presentation. It maxed out in terms of its registration at 999 attendees. Uh, we may not see that many people in the room today, but one of the hot commodities here is people receive the recording if they're not able to actually make it to the session. So we're so thrilled to see so much interest in this topic today. Um, the session is being recorded, as Lauren from ACRL pointed out. And when the recording, recording is ready, we'll get it sent out to you all along with slides and any other supplemental documentation to everyone who registered for the program, as I said. Today's program will be about an hour total, including time for questions. Um, the most of the time for questions will be allotted at the end, but our speaker, Krista, has indicated that they'll be happy to invite questions partway through the presentation as well. So please feel free to add questions into the chat box throughout the presentation at any time. My colleague Rebecca Graff will be collating them and will be prepared to read them to Krista at the appropriate times. And you'll see us continue to reinforce this, but as you are using the chat feature, please make sure you send your messages to all panelists and attendees. Zoom defaults to just all panelists. Um, so this will ensure that everyone can see what you're asking. And finally, just a heads up that you'll see us post a link to a program assessment and the chat box after the Q&A session at the end of this program. And we hope you'll take a few moments to give the ACRL University Library Section Professional Development Committee some feedback and some feedback we can share with our presenter, Krista, as well. So with those announcements out of the way, I'm very happy to start today's program. Our presenter is Krista McCracken. Krista is a non-binary archivist with over 10 years experience working in academic libraries. They currently work as an archive supervisor at Algoma University's Arthur A. Wishart Library and Shingwok Residential Schools Center. Krista's areas of expertise include community archives, access, open education, and outreach. And before I hand it all the way over to Krista, I'd just like to draw your attention uh, to the ground rules that are articulated here on the opening slide today. Again, we're so thrilled that there's so much interest in this important topic and also realize that many of us will be learning about new information today. So we ask that you'll keep the following in mind throughout the presentation, that you'll listen to understand and respect the ideas of others, that you will share airtime, which for the record should be easy because most of you cannot talk, um, only the panelists can verbalize during this presentation, but even in chat, just being mindful of not dominating too much of the conversation. Um, speak only for yourself, please using I statements and please don't share another person's experience without their permission, either in the context of sharing today during the presentation or after you leave this presentation today. So thank you so much for helping us adhere to those and making sure it's a great session for everyone. And without further delay, I will hand it over to Krista, if you're ready. Yeah, thank All you right, so great. much, Laura. Sure, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, so to get started, there is an optional activity for folks uh, that the link will be shared in the chat, but you're welcome to share your pronouns. And I also wanted to open with a land acknowledgement. So I live and work on Robinson Huron Treaty Territory, the traditional homeland of the Anishinaabe and Métis people. Likewise, I really wanted to start off our discussion today by introducing myself and providing um, kind of some positionality around where I'm coming from. So I am a non-binary person and I've been working in academic library spaces for a bit over a decade. I currently work at a small academic institution, which means I've had the opportunity to be involved in policy development, planning of spaces, and broader library programming. Um, but I'm only one person and my experiences are definitely my own. 
I did change my pronouns while working at my current place of work and that's you know my experience and I definitely really want to acknowledge the work of so many great trans and gender non-conforming librarians and activists out there who've really been leading the way in this work. Likewise, I really recognize that I am white. I work in a unionized, fairly supportive work environment. And I have a lot of privilege in my job and in my life. And my experience is vastly different from trans uh, people of color and other folks who are marginalized in other ways. So kind of the plan for today is I'm going to talk broadly about some common language around transgender and gender nonconforming identities and really focusing on examples of policies and things that can make a difference in your library practice and in your organization. I would really note that this webinar definitely isn't going to cover everything. It is a starting point and I hope it is something that is going to get you thinking, um, but it's definitely one piece of much broader learning that needs to happen. And so why does this matter? I really hope, you know, if you signed up for this webinar, you probably have an inkling of why this might matter and you have a sense of that. And trans folks and gender non-conforming folk are everywhere. You likely have transgender or uh, co-workers or patrons who you serve and building an awareness of gender identities and the barriers that folks with different identities face can really help you advocate for change. I also really think it's important to acknowledge that many folks who you know have gone through library school didn't learn about serving this community and a lack of knowledge can impact decisions we make and how we address folks and hopefully this webinar is a start to kind of moving towards more knowledge that you hold. Um, I also think this webinar is particularly important right now in this moment when we're seeing a rise of anti-trans groups looking to book spaces in libraries and academic institutions. You only have to look at like the Toronto Public Library, uh, the Vancouver Public Library, Seattle Public Library, uh, Simon Fraser University and other organizations to see the impact that decision making has had on the trans community. Uh, decisions about space and policy can make or break a library's relationship with the trans community. Um, and I think that's something we really need to acknowledge. So as we go through our time together today, it might be helpful for you to think about how does transphobia and structural barriers affect your employees, your coworkers and patrons? Uh, and to think about how you can work to break down those barriers in your place of work. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about language and some of the terms that I'm going to be using throughout the webinar. The Terms that I've kind of defined up on the screen are transgender and cisgender, and these are common identifiers to talk about gender identity and gender expression. I would note that language is definitely imperfect. It changes over time and both individual and collective understandings of language can evolve. And the def definitions that I'm sharing aren't the be all and end all, but they are frequently used for understanding uh, and discussing gender identity. Uh, so transgender is an umbrella term for folks whose gender identity differs from what they were assigned with at birth, whereas cisgender is the term used to describe people who identify with the gender they were assigned at birth. Likewise, I'm going to be using the phrase gender nonconforming or gender variant throughout this presentation, 
these are just some of the terms that folks use to describe um, themselves or people who experience gender identity outside the binary of men and women. Um, I would say that there's a huge range of ways that people might identify beyond the gender binary. And I would really encourage you to listen to people if they express how they identify and don't attempt to fit people into categories. People don't fit in boxes and we shouldn't try and make them do so. And so I think language is really important when we're talking about the intersection of library work and trans identities. There's a couple kind of ground rules or best practices that I thought would be really important to start off by talking about. So you can't tell anything about someone's gender identity or pronouns by looking at them. You need to respect what people call themselves and don't assign terms such as trans or cisgender to somebody without hearing from them first. And also realize that identities can change over time. People have the right to change their pronouns and change their identities. Um, so my pronouns are they, them. If you had have spoken to me 10 years ago, my pronouns at that time were she, her. It has definitely evolved for me. Um, and part of this, you know, good care around using language is to just use people's pronouns, to practice using them. And I'd also note you should never force somebody to share their pronouns, there's their pronouns. There's a whole range of reasons why somebody might not feel comfortable sharing their pronouns in a particular setting. Um, so even though, you know, it might be a good intention to say to everybody in a workshop, oh, we're going to start by having everybody share their pronouns. That might be unintentionally outing somebody who is trans or might be making somebody identify with pronouns that they don't really feel because they don't feel safe in the space. Um, I would also note that there's probably gonna be a bit of a learning curve and that you're likely gonna screw up when using new pronouns for a person. If you catch yourself making a mistake, switch to the right pronoun. Um, if you realize later on that you made a mistake, a simple, hey, I'm sorry, I used the wrong pronouns for you earlier, I'm practicing and we'll get it right next time is sufficient. Do not make the mistake about you. Um, and also don't ask the person to correct you in the future. The practicing part needs to be on you. And asking somebody to remind you can be really joining on them and even ask, um, and, can be really intimidating as well. Um, when I share my slides later, the link here actually um, links to an app that helps you practice pronouns. So there's lots of options for different ways you can learn about it. Um, but also note if you see somebody else uh, misgendering a coworker or a patron, there's a few different ways you could potentially intervene and reaffirm the correct pronouns in conversation. So a simple, oh, I'm not sure you know, but Krista uses they, them pronouns could be a way to address it with somebody else. And there's lots of ways that we use gender inclusive language already. Um, and normalizing the use of gender I, diverse identities through language is something that can really have an immediate impact in your community. And it really requires very little financial investment by an institution. So I've included some examples of wording on the slide. Um, but beyond what you actually say to people, you can also work on removing gendered language from, you know, your promotional material or other material that 
um, is used internally in your library. So this might include removing pronouns from job ads that you're posting, removing gendered salutations from automated messages, and working with staff to avoid phrases like sir and ma'am or ladies and gentlemen. It might also look like removing gendered honorifics from forms and changing documents that say she and he to just they. Um, it could also look like when you're onboarding new staff to confirm the person's name and pronouns before you actually go about, you know, ordering business cards, setting up their emails and ordering name tags. And using inclusive language is just, you know, one of many ways that libraries can support trans people publicly. And it's a way to kind of express that uh, people with diverse gender identities are welcome in library spaces. And when we think about the intersection of libraries and names, uh, we really need to think beyond just the language we use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, there's a lot of library systems that include patron and staff names. And many trans and non-binary folk use names that are different from their legal names. And this is sometimes for a huge range of reasons, um, but changing your name legally, depending on where you live, can be a really lengthy and expensive process. Um, but library systems which only use legal names can put folks in really uncomfortable and sometimes precarious situations. So just as a couple examples of how names and libraries intersect, like how are your names on holds and library cards populated? Do the forms that your library use auto-populate names? Does your website display usernames or legal names? Um, all of these instances could be creating barriers for trans participation in library services and programming. Um, beyond that, if we know that libraries you know, collect names. How does your library system support name changes for patron? Are they able to change the name in your system even if they haven't changed their legal name? And how can users or patrons control what name displays where? Um, are there ways you can just not show a name on certain things? Um, kind of as an aside to that, I'd also argue that there's a lot of cases that libraries don't need to know what gender folks are. Um, like, why are we collecting this information? Um, if you need to record gender, say for funding reasons, um, I'd also encourage you to include like a fill in the blank option, not just a male, female, other checkbox. Um, so thinking about systems, even if they aren't perfect and I have yet to meet a library system that is perfect. Um, there are a few things that you can do that might be less labor intensive. Um, so things like adding notes to account profiles that say this user goes by X name, uh, modeling using someone's name in conversation, um, not auto-populating names in forms, um, using uh, ORCID IDs or other scholarly identifiers uh, instead of names attached to records, um, and just having options for people being able to change their name I think is really important. Um, just because being called by the wrong name can be so actively harmful, but I think this is kind of like the bare minimum that libraries need to be thinking about and need to be doing right now. Um, so before we go any further, um, where I'm diving more into library programming and policies, I wanted to check and make sure that we were all on the same page in terms of the language that I'm using um, just before moving forward.
Rebecca, have any questions come in that we should put forward now? Rebecca is stuck and unable to unmute. There okay, she so here it is. <laughs> Victory. <laughs> ah, I'm speaking. I really am. Sorry for the scream. There are, some, there are many, many questions and comments. Um, one of them is about the systems. Mm -hmm. um, what gender choices, if any, do you offer in ILS systems for patrons? Yeah, um, so check boxes are horrible and you're never gonna be able to fit every single gender identity in a drop-down menu. Um, there's just so many different variations. Uh, my personal preference is you just have a fill in the blank. Okay. So people can, can identify yeah, can themselves. can identify themselves, yeah. Um, there have been a number of comments about language, um, commenting that in the South, y'all is very helpful. Yeah. Uh, other I, suggestions. And there's a list. I just want you to hear them. And other people are comrades, fellow humans, my good people of, um, <laughs> colleagues, team, friends, you guys, colleagues. And there's now a discussion about the word folks, F-O-L-K-S versus folks, F-O-L-X. Yes, those uh, folks tends to be my favorite, personally. Which one? And why? <laughs> yeah, um, so that's a complicated response. Um, I tend to use, if I'm typing, I use LKS, um, but um, folks with an X is, from my understanding anyways, intended to be more inclusive in directly speaking to uh, marginalized communities or folks who not, might not be included in other expressions of that word. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's an individual choice and either is fine to use. There's actually a really good gender reveal podcast that discusses that entirely. Um, someone commented that in North Carolina, at least one program has the motto, y'all means all. That is awesome. That's nice. Um, do you have any comments about things such as um, Latinx or Chicanx using gender neutral? Um, I don't think I feel comfortable enough speaking in about that since it's not my particular culture. Um, yeah. Okay. And somebody early on asked a question about just things gender neutral. What, what is your position more generally on that? Yeah. Um, so gender neutral, I think, is in terms of like an identity or in terms of language? In terms of language, um, a number of people are commenting that, you know, even though the word guys was suggested that guys can be problematic. I would agree. Um, so I would say that guys um, really does, it references a particular gender, whereas like a group of people or everyone or y'all, um, doesn't have a specific gender attached to it, which makes it more neutral. And currently the people are talking about the word dude, whether or not it's gender neutral. <laughs> yeah. I think it might be generational. Yes. Yeah. Ninja Turtles, anyone? <laughs> Team Andre. Yeah. Uh, all right. I think those are all the questions for now. Please let me know if we haven't asked and I will um, repeat your question and I will make sure that we'll get to it at the end. Great. So we're going to keep going and dive uh, a bit more into specific uh, library spaces and programs and policies. Um, so libraries as public spaces or spaces that are used by the public, there's so many different structural barriers that are sometimes built into these spaces. Uh, one of them, kind of the obvious one that a lot of people talk about is washrooms. Uh, trans and gender non-conforming folk are often targeted and harassed for their washroom usage. They're sometimes denied entry to washrooms or physically harmed for using a space. 
does your library have all gender restrooms? Either a single stall or a multi stall all gender washroom? Um, if not, is there any way you can advocate for that? Um, definitely recognizing that, you know, we work in libraries are working with finite, often underfunded budgets, and you might not have the funding to build new washrooms, but can you convert existing washrooms or can they added to be added to future construction, construction plans? Um, or can you put affirming signage in existing restroom spaces um, or provide information about gender neutral restrooms nearby? Um, another thing that can help make washrooms uh, more accessible to trans and uh, gender nonconforming folk is putting sanitary receptacles in washrooms of all genders, not just washrooms that are assigned for female use. Um, also, as a note, you should never force a trans person to use an all gender washroom and you shouldn't direct people to specific washrooms based on their appearance. Um, basically, tell people where all the washrooms are and let them decide for themselves which one to use. Um, part of this is also connected to, you know, placing welcoming and trans positive signage. So that could be in your washroom and also more broadly throughout your space. It could be books, it could be posters, uh, it could be as simple as stickers on certain things. Um, though I would encourage you to move beyond simply adding pride rainbows to things and think specifically about, you know, how can you showcase trans role models, photos of trans people, and sharing the work of trans folks. This sends a really clear message that trans and gender diverse folk are welcome and entitled to use the space. Um, I would note that when thinking about creating affirming spaces, you also need to think about the policies behind these spaces. You know, it's no good putting up nice little posters if your staff or your policies are actively harming trans people. So if people are still policing washrooms or if, you know, you're renting out your rooms to anti-trans folks, having those nice, you know, pride flags or posters isn't actually helping. In terms of library programming, um, I know as somebody who works doing programming that this can be really time consuming and uh, can also be underfunded in many cases. Um, but I think that if you're looking to develop a space that is welcoming to trans and gender variant folks, you developing programming that is affirming um, can show that you have a really strong commitment to the trans community. And part of this is educating staff. Um, so we know that librarians end up doing a lot of emotional labor and support work for both students and patrons. And if you're in a library that's in academia, for example, library staff are often in a position of mentoring students. So particularly like uh, student workers, as well as those students who are really heavy library users. Um, and when I'm thinking about that emotional labor piece is knowing what resources there are in your community. Um, so knowing like, who you can refer a student to and what resources are on campus or in your community can be really important if you're a frontline staff person. Um, so many communities or campuses have like a queer resource center or a pride center um, that you might be able to share uh, with students or patrons uh, either in the form of you know handouts um, or direct referrals. 
I would also say that if there isn't one in your community, um, really look to those online resources that you can share. This is also the piece where you can start building those relationships. So um, if you don't have the capacity in-house to actively support trans-specific programming, are there ways that you can partnership, build partnerships with trans advocacy groups and center local trans voices? Um, thinking about library programming more broadly, it is really important to also think about what resources you're offering and your collections. Has someone done a survey of um, your resources to see if they're inclusive of a broad range of gender identity? Um, and if you do have that material, how are people locating it? Is it, um, like, do you have a guide to it? Are existing resources being used? Are they just on the shelf and not being checked out? Are they relevant and up to date? I'd say this one's particularly important because there is a lot of um, older literature out there that can be actively harmful and use language uh, that is particularly dated. So taking a look at what content you have is really important. Um, I know some libraries have uh, created lib guides on uh, transgender studies as a way to, you know, point researchers to relevant resources. Um, I would note that um, I really discourage from like putting stickers on books if you're in a public library that, you know, broadly identify a book as being trans specific. That could be a barrier for folks who are not publicly out about their gender identity and they might not feel comfortable checking out that book or you know walking with it in a public space so just being conscious about how you're making that material accessible um, I would also really encourage you to think about library programming beyond pride month or pride week and beyond trans day of remembrance um, trans folk and gender variant folk exist all the time, not just, you know, one day of the year. And so making programming that's relevant on an ongoing basis can be really important. Um, so everything that I've been talking about to this point is really about practices. And some of those things are, you know, little actions you can do no matter what the policy is at your workplace, like not assuming somebody's gender. That's something you can do immediately. Um, but other types of practices need to be supported by institutional change and by good policy development. So policies can cover everything from employee and gender, employee gender transition guidelines, privacy, how you update patron records, uh, gender neutral dress codes, and policies around uh, professional development training specifically targeted to uh, knowledge about gender identity. And I know policy development takes a lot of work, but the impact uh, that it can have on staff and patrons is really huge. Um, and policies need to be in place in order to be enforced in any way, shape, or form. Um, if someone experiences transphobia or discrimination based on their gender identity, they need to be supported by policies that people know about. So in addition to just, you know, creating them and then going in a binder on a circulation desk, you need to make sure that all current and new staff are aware of what these policies are. Um, ideally, I think this policy development work needs to be built into things like strategic plans. And as organizations, as libraries, we need to uh, create a realistic and practical timelines for implementing changes. 
and those changes might be small at first, but I do think um, it's important to consider how a small change can impact someone's life on a, a deeply personal library. Uh, when we're talking about policies, you know, I mentioned at the very start of this webinar, uh, the rise of anti-trans groups with room bookings in library spaces. What is your room booking policy? Um, and what would your library do if they were contacted and approached to host an event that's going to impact the trans community in a very negative way? How would you respond? Um, you need to be thinking about those responses before it happens. Um, I would also suggest that folks look at uh, LGBTQ safety awareness training or trans inclusion workshops as part of organization professional development um, and that administration actively work to support this form of professional development. Uh, so some examples of that type of programming might be uh, the Safe Zone project for uh, the 519 does uh, a workplace readiness um, toolkit around trans inclusion. So we've been talking a lot about, you know, steps your institution can take. And I want to acknowledge that, you know, we're all at different places in this journey and that it is going to take a lot of time and it is going to take some work. Uh, there is a really great uh, institutional assessment worksheet that was created in 2017. Um, it's a good starting point if you're looking to, you know, reflect on your own institution following this webinar um, and the progress you've made or lack of progress that you made. Um, I've also created a Padlet, the links on this slide here, where um, I'm really encouraging folks to share what you or your institution are at and what are you doing on this journey. Um, and noting that it's okay if you haven't done anything yet. The fact that you, know, you showed up today for this webinar counts for something. And I think it really reflects a desire to learn more, hopefully, and hopefully start to make some meaningful change. Um, and I'll definitely keep this Padlet active after the session so that you know, if you wanna look at what other institutions are doing, it might be a place you can hop back to. Um, just as kind of some concluding thoughts before we dive into questions. Um, you need to do the work. You're probably going to screw up doing the work um, and that is okay. You should be open to taking criticism, learning from it, and I would really encourage you to center the voices and needs of trans and gender diverse folks in your work. However, uh, do not expect gender diverse and trans folks to educate you on the basics of gender identity and the basics of transphobia. Librarians, you work in libraries, you know how the internet works. Uh, use Google, seek out some of that basic information on your own. Um, uplift the voices of trans folks and listen to them if they have complaints about what you're doing, about your library's programming and services. Um, I'd also note that this work isn't always going to be easy. In some cases, it's going to be downright exhausting and feel like you're fighting a battle that is never going to end. Um, feel free to take breaks, to rest, but keep working. I really do believe that this is vitally important work that really needs to be done in so many spaces, but particularly in library spaces. Uh, so there's some additional resources. And like I said, I will share these slides and you can look at those hyperlinks. Uh, but thank you folks so much for listening and I'm looking forward to discussion during the question session.
Okay, can you hear me? Excellent. Yeah. Um, we've had a lot of questions and comments. I hope we can get to all of them. Um, so start pretty much in order. Any advice on how to handle situations where infrastructure is in place, such as a gender neutral restroom, but lack of staff understanding about why it needs to be available? There are places where you know, certain rooms get locked and are only available to parents with young children or people with visible disabilities. So how do you open up the space? Yeah, um, so I actually went through a very similar thing at the library that I worked at that the only restrooms in the library were all single stall, but they were all gender designated. Um, and part of that was doing internal education. So sharing resources um, and studies that have been done on libraries and trans inclusion um, and looking to organizations that are advocating for trans rights. Um, I know that these are sometimes difficult conversations and you might get some pushback um, but looking at, you know, safety and statistics that we know are out there around trans safety, I think is how you can help build that argument. Okay. Um, what is the difference between gender neutral and gender inclusive speech? Can you give some examples? Yeah. Um, so gender inclusive is including a broad range of gender identities. Uh, so you might be acknowledging many um, identities, but gender neutral um, isn't assigning a gender to something. Um, so gender inclusive, say you're creating a form that uh, has honorifics on it, which, you know, I would encourage you not to, but anyways, um, having say Mr., Mrs., and Mix, which is the gender neutral honorific, um, but it's also including it in that list, I think is part of it. I definitely say there's some overlap between the two of them. Um, and the piece with gender neutral language, I would say is that it's for when you don't know somebody's gender identity or they've asked you to use gender neutral language. Okay, um, I think these, questions and comments are somewhat related. Um, what are some methods for public libraries and somebody else added in and academic libraries <laughs> to discourage harmful or hateful groups from using their space, which is technically public? There's some yeah. First Amendment questions. Um, full disclosure, I live in Canada, so different legislation applying to that. Um, and even the institutions in Canada that we thought had really good room booking policies, they folded under some pressure. Um, and so I do think part of it is having good policies in place, uh, particularly language around hate speech, um, as well as working to, I think if your library is already established as a place that is actively supporting trans communities, when it comes to fighting against those room bookings, you're gonna have that group of people already there to help fight and it's gonna be a fight, unfortunately. Um, a couple suggestions were that um, to minimize hate groups, um, state that, that it has to align with the library's mission, vision, vision and values and they must mm -hmm. prove it in their application Another one um, is that library only allows meetings that are open to the general public, no closed gatherings. So those were a couple related ones. Um, can you talk about current perceptions of quiet inclusion in library collections? Yeah, um, so that's a, that's a good phrase. Um, and I think that, so I, I kind of went on a little tangent there about stickers on books and um, yeah, but that, I think that's that, mentioned in the question. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that really, that's the opposite of quiet inclusion. Um, thinking about, you know, public library spaces or academic spaces where um, maybe people don't feel comfortable asking for help finding certain types of books or reading those books. Um, so you're including them, you know, and cataloging them the same way you would include other books, be those books that are 
focused on gender identities or written by, you know, trans authors or gender diverse authors. So instead of, you know, placing them in a special corner that is like a pride corner, they're just in the inclusion, like in the collection as a whole. Um, how do you recommend, you know, making it more open then? Yeah. So, I mean, in making it, you know, inclusive within the collection, but how do you get people to them? How do you make them more yeah. accessible? Uh, so I think there's ways you can work to make those more accessible. So the example of one library creating a libguide or like those handouts that maybe sh showcase some of the new um, additions to the collection, including books by trans authors in your regular book displays or books about gender identity in regular book displays and regular um, you know, handouts that you do recommending books can be a way to make sure that people are aware they exist without maybe stigmatizing them in some way. Um, are there any specific tips for keeping the catalog metadata up to date and gender inclusive? Well, I think there could be a whole webinar on that um, and depending on what type of, you know, system you're using. Um, that being said, there is some really great work going on uh, to get some of the Library of Congress subject headings revised to be more inclusive. I want to say it's Violet Fox who has been updating uh, people on some of that work. Um, and so there are people out there who specialize in metadata who are trying to advocate for that. And I'd suggest if you're interested in that, trying to follow some of their work. Somebody commented about self-checkout is yeah. essential for allowing people to be private in their selections. I think that's a great point. Um, particularly if you're dealing with youth, I think self-checkout, it was a really key way. Somebody commented that uh, they would sign up for the metadata webinar. <laughs> I think we have our follow-up right there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, how do you recommend working with people who are offended by the creation of such guides as LBGTQ plus or displays um, or? Yeah, um, so that's try not to answer that from a very personal perspective um, because if they're offended by that, they're basically offended that I exist and um, it's really hard for me to argue with somebody who says your identity or your gender isn't valid. It isn't exist. It's nonsense. Um, I think there are ways you can do some education work that is for people who are in the middle ground, but if people are outright against it, I think there's, you got to pick your battles. Y'all means all. Yeah. <laughs> Um, somebody mentioned that they are trying to get unlimited digital copies of books related to trans topics mm -hmm. since print can be defaced in ways and that can be hurtful. Yeah, that's oh. a great idea. Um, and if you have like a growing ebook collection, maybe looking at that as an option for growth instead of physical copies. Okay. I think that those were all the questions that came in. Um, oh, there's some new questions. Excellent. Um, is there a good resource for examples of good gender neutral inclusive signage? There are a lot out there. Um, the Safe Zone project that I mentioned earlier, as well as uh, the 519 are really good examples. Um, there is also a book written specifically about trans and gender variant inclusion in libraries that I linked to on the resource slide. Um, and highly recommend it is specific to library workspaces and it includes a whole set of um, recommendations on signage and language. So maybe and our it will, it will be a couple days before we send out all this information maybe we can make sure we add that information to the subsequent um, stuff. Does that sound fair? Yeah. Yes okay let's see I've read the Gender Spectrum Collection by Vice and gave some a URL. Right. Any other questions? 
Uh, Rebecca, uh, this is Laura. Sorry, let me jump in. There's one from Guelph University that came in. Oh, uh, yeah, I was getting there. Gotcha. Sorry, I wasn't sure if it slipped by. They posted. Yeah. Are there specific assessment methods or collection development tools for uh, academic collections to improve collections in these areas? That's a really good question. Um, and so the Transgender Inclusion Institutional Assessment Worksheet was created by librarians. And I do believe there is some guidelines on collection development in it. Um, likewise, the inclusion in libraries reading list, I think has at least like a handful of readings that are specific to collection development. Um, I'd also say another way to approach collection development is looking at institutions that are doing a really good job with this. So if you know of another academic institution, like in Canada, uh, University of Victoria is one that is doing really great work, um, turning to them for advice and looking at their policies might be a good place to start. Uh, and a number of different selection tools allow you to limit by call number ranges, uh, several at a time. Um, we'll have interdisciplinary subject areas. There are ways of doing some advanced search, search strategies that get at a number of uh, inclusive searches. Yeah. Just again, watch out for those kind of horrible library of Congress subject headings when doing that, but yeah. Okay. In academic institutions, how do you not use people's names? What if the student account needs to be used for school related reasons? Yeah, um, so you could, if, in addition to student name, assumably they're assigned a student number. Is there a way you can use that as the primary um, identifier on their account? Um, alternatively, I do work at an institution that allows students to change their own name in, on all their IT records. Um, and so that does everything from class lists to their library cards. Um, so yeah, there are ways around it, um, but in academic institutions, it's probably going to require uh, cross-department collaboration to have something happen. Okay. Other questions? Krista, is there anything that you edited out because you thought we wouldn't have time? So we have a few <laughs> more minutes. Yeah. Um, I think, a lot, I mean, I suspect people are pontificating it, and it will take a little while for the questions to come. Yeah, uh, which is totally fine. I covered kind of a broad overview of a lot of topics all at once. Uh, I would also note that uh, you're welcome to email me uh, or, you know, send me a note on Twitter. Um, I'm happy if folks have follow up questions. They're welcome to reach out to me in that form. I will post the contact info for in chat, makes it easier. Um, and I will, the slides are just in Google Slides, so I will likely share the link to the slides on Twitter okay. pretty much immediately. So if you want to like check out some of those hyperlinks, you can do so very quickly. Excellent. Well, Rebecca, thank you so much for your extremely able collating of questions throughout the session. There were many and a nice job capturing the commentary that Krista may not have been, to see to, been able to see too. But most of all, thank you so much, Krista, for sharing your experience, your expertise with us today. Um, please join me, everyone, in thanking them for their generous sharing. Um, I'd also like to thank the many great folks at ACRL who helped make each of these programs we offer a success through their technical support and their assistance with all the marketing to make it happen. Um, we will be sending out the link to the presentation as well as the recording um, and other supplemental documents for the session when it's available. Several of you have already asked that the chat transcript will be included and it will not be included intact, but we will be extracting all the great links you all have shared throughout the program. You'll also see me dropping in the link to the program evaluation in the chat here. Here it comes. Um, we'd be very grateful if you could take a moment to fill that out. So we at the Professional Development Committee have some feedback and that we can share that with Krista as well. And 
Finally, I hope you'll take a moment to visit our LibGuide with the Professional Development Committee to see some future programming we have coming up. I'll drop that link in too real quick. And, um, and you'll see me continue to drop these links as you're all signing out and bidding farewell. So thank you so much again. And again, Krista, thank you, thank you, thank you. So informative. Absolutely. And, and Laura, don't forget, people will have the opportunity to volunteer for PDC. So uh, that is, you, uh, do you mean to be on the committee, Rebecca? Yes, or? Yeah, yes, yes. So there'll be opportunities. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so the ACRL deadline was in February to volunteer oh, for committees. But for next apologize. year, <laughs> if you it's find a great it, committee. It is. It's a really, really fulfilling committee. So again, thank you so much, Krista. Thank you, everybody. Um, we'll go ahead and mute our mics. But if anyone needs anything, feel free to use the chat box to say so. And we look forward to seeing you at future programs.